Just... Oh, good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure, actually, to have uh, Dan and I have been talking about this since the, we rolled out the first IHS report. Um, and looking at it at a different granular level, and you actually have taken it down to new sites by being able to go through into con congressional districts and see what the economic impacts. But this is also the first one of that wave that looked at a lower price environment as well, because the world has markedly changed over the last uh, eight months or so. Um, what we decided to do with this is to have participatory to the extent that we're going to let our presenters walk through the, the highlights of the report first. Uh, we found a few folks that we wanted to tee up to make some initial comments, but then I would actually welcome uh, commentary because the exports issue and the production issue has been extremely important to a lot of people, uh, not without controversy, and the timing of this is terrific. So uh, again, we can have seats on here. There's copies of the report that we will distribute as soon as the presentation is done, and they're out in the back, and Annie will make sure that you have them. And so joining uh, Dan Jurgen today, Dan is the vice chairman of IHS. Uh, he's a familiar face to many of you, to all of you, I suspect, and that's probably why you're here. Um, Pulitzer Prize winning author, good friend <laughs> and supporter of CSIS. He's joined today by Kurt Barrow. Kurt is the Vice President of Oil Markets and Downstream for IHS. Kurt was here when we talked about the export study the first go-round. Um, he's got extensive experience in the downstream. He began his career at Exxon at the Baytown Refinery and was a VP for Pervin and Gertz. And Rick Bott, who's sitting to uh, Kurt's right. Uh, Rick is currently a senior advisor uh, with uh, IHS. And we were just talking about uh, his uh, experience in the oil industry as well. He was president and CEO of Continental Resources. He was VP of International Exploration for Devon and held a number of other positions over the last 30 years. Uh, so this is an extremely knowledgeable group. And we're actually uh, interested in not only the discussion, but we're going to let you do the presentation first. And then we'll move to that point. And Dan, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Frank. I want to thank you and CSIS for hosting. And as you say, uh, it's an extremely knowledgeable group, which I think you mean the whole group that's Absolutely. here. So we'll have, I, I think, a very good discussion after we take you through this all. Uh, it was last May that we presented the first phase of our study. We've been working on this issue for a little, uh, almost like a year and a half now. And uh, it's only grown more urgent as we have uh, been working on it. When we did the first report, there were two key themes which I want to reiterate today. One is the extraordinary growth in U.S. oil production, as we all know, up more than 80 percent since 2008. And that has led to uh, this, the basic point, the mismatch between the quality of the crude and the refining capacity in the Gulf Coast. And that's leading to the discounts that the, because the market has great difficulty in absorbing it. The second thing, and uh, we've actually gotten very curious and I remember discussing with Senator Johnston it, I mean, where did this crude oil ban come from? And just to remind you, obviously it came out of the tumult of the 1970s, but there was a very specific reason for it. And the specific reason is because we had price controls. And if you had price controls, you didn't want to be able to allow people to export oil because that would circumvent and undermine the price controls. So. Uh, but the price controls were abolished in uh, January of 1981. Less well known, there were also a ban on the export of products. And of course, today, on a gross basis, the US is the largest exporter of products. That was abolished in uh, October of 1981. And we went back into the archives. We couldn't find the emails. We tried. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Uh, but it was very interesting because it just seemed to have been done almost kind of casually, uh, uh, just not casually, but thoughtfully, but done on the basis that it was in the national interest not to have the ban, and there's no big kerflunkle about it in terms of products. And of course, the ban on crude oil remained there, and uh, it didn't matter for a couple of decades that it was there. Well, it matters now. And so the two themes of the new report are first is the impact of the price collapse makes it much more urgent now than it was when we did the first report to lift this ban because of the impact that the discount creates uh, for domestic production. Uh, and secondly, uh, and that the difference between world prices and US prices can be the difference between the viability and non-viability of a great deal of investment. 
Uh, the second point, and this is what we got very interested to understand, is the nature of the supply chain. Uh, how does it reach into the whole uh, country? Does it? And here we brought together both the energy and economic analysis capabilities of IHS. And I think we were surprised to find out how dense these supply chains are, and they reach into every part of the country, virtually every state, even those with marginal or no production. And uh, I think Kurt will talk about them. It's New York, states you wouldn't think about, Florida, Washington State, and of course the manufacturing Midwest is a very big beneficiary of these supply chains. Uh, and we analyzed it, it's not in the report, but if you go on the website, down actually to the congressional levels. Um, but in a way, you know, is it surprising or it's not surprising if you go from producing 40% of your oil as we were in 2005 to 73% as we're doing today, that is a lot of economic activity that has to be behind it. And in this, we're only looking at the supply chain in terms of, uh, of, of tight oil uh, and oil not in terms of natural gas. And I think maybe one third conclusion we came to, there can be efforts to um, uh, create regulatory half houses, let's say, call it that way, to kind of facilitate or let, take some of the pressure off. But in our view, uh, creating kind of regulatory pretzels uh, in order to just avoid dealing head on with the issue is really counterproductive and, uh, and really works against the market adapting to the situation. So in terms of the impact of the price collapse, uh, with the price collapse, it increases the sensitivity to the discount. Uh, over the last 30 days, the discount has been between $9 and $10. Uh, that's, very, uh, that's a very big discount. And when prices are lower, the negative impacts on jobs and the economy are, are more, not less. And uh, as we'll talk about, a $3 change in a $50 environment can have the same effect as a $10 change in a $100 environment. Um, and this brings us back to the export ban because, of course, because of the export ban, that's why we have the discount. It reduces U.S. oil production, supply chain activity, as we'll discuss, job growth, but it also raises, and we can get into it, uh, gasoline prices. Um, right now, um, and it's astonishing if you kind of compare it to a few years ago to think that U.S. production now is up with Saudi production and Russian production, but this growth that we've seen will certainly be imperiled by continuing this outdated uh, policy. Uh, we've seen the cuts in uh, budgets uh, and the discounts add to those cuts. We'll talk about that some more. And I think it's important uh, if policymakers on the national legis le level, legislators are looking to um, uh, take some of the pressure from the collapse, reduce the pressure, uh, then one of the most concrete action that people can take is to remove this ban. And that is uh, important not only for policymakers at the federal level, it's also important for policymakers at the state level to understand that. There's another element um, which I want to comment on that doesn't figure so much in the study, but uh, we talk about it, but I think it's really important to have on the table. And that removing this ban will strengthen U.S. national security and U.S. influence in the world. Uh, it obviously restores incentives to invest at a lower prices. It, it continues our ability to partner with uh, Mexico and uh, Canada in this new foundation that we have for regional uh, and hemispheric security. And I think the basic point is the U.S. benefits from open markets, not uh, from regional monopolies of one kind or another. And I would go so far as to say Iran would not be at the negotiating table today on nuclear weapons were it not for the increase in domestic U.S. oil production. Because, uh, going back to 2011, 2012, the Iranians, like many others, thought the world market would not be able to withstand the withholding of their supply uh, from the world market. But very significant, the increase in U.S. production made those sanctions work. And what I wanted to do was actually quote our new colleague, Carlos Pasquale. He's uh, known to many of you. He was the U.S. energy envoy. He started the, uh, the Energy Bureau in the State Department, had been ambassador to Mexico and ambassador to, uh, uh, to Ukraine. And he was uh, testifying last week, uh, Senator Johnson, to your old committee, the Senate Energy Committee. And I just want to read two quotes from him that I think actually uh, present this dimension of it very clearly. 
he notes that the U.S. and Europe impose sanctions on Iran's oil exports and that we engage a whole host of countries to curtail their imports and diversify sources. Carlos went on to say, as the per person who's coordinating those negotiations, indeed, he was a person who did a lot of those negotiations, he said, I can assure the committee that the U.S. negotiating position would have been far stronger if we were not protecting U.S. oil export restrictions when we were asking others to ra risk higher oil prices for national security. Then he went on to say that the maintaining the export ban, and this comes from his experience of dealing with a host of countries around the world, he went on to say maintaining the export ban increasingly undercuts U.S. Cr credibility in its three decades endeavor to persuade other nations to permit free flows of energy trade and not constrain trade in strategic commodities with political restrictions and resource nationalism, which in effect this e export ban is. And then he added, and many people don't know this, the United States has launched numerous complaints under the WTO against China exactly because of these kind of restrictions on natural resources that China imposes. It would be against our interest to see Russia use such precedents today to curtail gas supplies to Europe. So I wanted to leave those thoughts with you because I think it's an important additional uh, element of this, particularly as the U.S. is looking about what do we do about sanctions on Russia, uh, uh, what do we do um, uh, with the continuing Ukrainian crisis. So U.S. benefits from global markets where all major producers allow global markets to drive resource avail availability. And basically the point is it's harder to get other nations to agree to action if the U.S. is seen as protecting in this antiquated way, uh, this archaic way, with this uh, antiquated and antique ban, uh, oil exports. Uh, so I think in today's challenging world, U.S. foreign policy and our influence uh, in the world needs to be part of the discussion on exports. So I'm going to leave that part of it. I think maybe we'll come back to the discussion, but I want to turn to Kurt Barrow, who led this study to explore what we learned about the economic realities with lower prices and the extent and the depth of the supply chain. Okay, Kurt. thanks, Dan. Now, I'll take, uh, take a little time here and go kind of down through the study. I'm gonna use some slides here. You know, as Dan said, this really builds on the work, um, you know, that, uh, that we presented back here uh, last summer and extends really the analysis down through, um, down through a supply chain that we defined as 60 uh, separate supply industries using various NACE uh, codes and subcodes and then also cutting the other way geographically down into the states and, uh, and congressional levels. And there's a, uh, Dan mentioned a web tool, I'll, I'll show you the link to it later, that uh, allows you to go on and really pull up whatever congressional district or supply chain you're in, interested in and see the actual data for, uh, you know, at that granular level. So, so what is a supply chain, right? It's, um, it's, it's sometimes hard to kind of articulate what we mean by supply chain. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing once we got into this because we, there's a, you know, kind of what you think of as the first tier suppliers, you know, the, the uh, companies that are actually in the labor that's being supplied directly to oil companies. But there's a multi-tiered supply chain behind that, if you will, the suppliers who supply that. So, you know, the drill rig has a lot of, uh, you know, engines, manufactured, engineered equipment, uh, IT, computer, uh, you know, services on it. You know, there's, there's a lot of... Um, depth of analysis and a lot of depth of uh, inputs, if you will, in that supply chain that go far beyond what you think of as drill pipe and, and plates and uh, uh, sand and, and uh, you know, the labor that's out on, the, uh, out on the drill rig. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we, uh, as we look at. You know, one of the key takeaways that we found from this, and, and, it, and it made sense, it was a bit counterintuitive when we first uh, started, but once we got into it and started looking at the data, it made a lot of sense, is that there's a, there's a very large multiplier effect uh, from jobs created in the oil and gas sector. And essentially, it, if for each job that gets created in the oil and gas sector from, you know, opening of the uh, export policy, uh, you get three jobs in the supply chain and another six in the broader economy from, from in, in, income effects. And so a lot of this, uh, a lot of the numbers and things I'll be talking about here over the next uh, 10 minutes or so are the three little gray guys there on the, uh, on the figure. So a lot of the data and analysis is, is looking at just the supply chain. So keep in mind, uh, and there are, I've got some of the broader economy uh, numbers in here as well, which you know, would include all 10, uh, all 10 uh, little icons here on the slide. 
Uh, but it's important to remember that when you're looking at a number, 124,000 jobs created in the supply chain for the base case, we are looking specifically at the supply chain and not, uh, not the total impact that we really expect from this. Similar multipliers in government income, GDP, uh, and the so forth that, uh, you know, that we'll get into. Maybe I'll step back just a little bit um, uh, to put this in context of, of the basis and, and uh, what we're looking at here on the numbers. So we did uh, two different production cases for the original study, and we stuck with those production cases for this study as well to tie these together. And I'll talk a little bit about how uh, those outlooks have changed because of the change in, uh, in the pricing environment, but also major changes in the productivity uh, that we're seeing in the field. A base case production was our central planning case. This is a, you know, what you might use to, to plan out your business. Very conservative, assumes that we just take what we know today. Uh, we don't get any better, faster, smarter, uh, and, and uh, don't have a lot of improvements. The potential case was more of an upside case where we continue to see learnings uh, in, in the upstream space. And we've, we've seen those in spades. We've seen a lot of productivity gains uh, really since we put our study out that are counteracting a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of the price signals. What we did in the study, it's important to remember that all the numbers that I'm going to show you and we're looking at are the delta between a current policy, restricted trade, and free trade. Uh, that's, the way we, uh, that's the way we did our modeling. And so what you'll see is that it's really this trade uh, policy decision between the base and potential cases. So uh, it's really a, a change in the trade policy uh, under those two different production uh, uh, scenarios. The impact on the supply chain shown here, uh, the supply chain ends up making up about a 30%, you know, give or take, uh, of the total impact. So you can see here uh, the numbers that are, that are on the slide. That's the uh, percent of the total impact that's in the supply chain for the base and potential case, so 31% of the employment impact for the base case is in the, uh, in the, uh, in the supply chain, 28% for the potential case, and so on and so forth for labor income, GDP, and, uh, and government revenue. Um, you know, the bars on the right show the, show the, uh, you know, the total overall impact over a couple different time frames, right? So the impact is most immediate early on, uh, you know, when you get this uh, initial uh, decision and you take away the uncertainty and allow the investment. But we model this out over 15 years. So this is a fairly long-term uh, impact that continues on uh, over the longer-term uh, uh, time frame. And just for reference, again, to kind of pull this back, um, you know, going with that 124,000 uh, jobs in the supply chain is 394,000 jobs in the broader, uh, broader overall economy and 86, 86 billion in, the, uh, in, in terms of GDP. One of the other key findings that, again, uh, makes a lot of sense once you think about it is we did a pretty deep analysis looking at, you know, essentially the supply curve for tidal production or, or total production in the U.S. 39,000 wells we analyzed uh, for the 2013 time frame, estimated the cost uh, of all those and developed out break-evens. And then what I'm showing you here is, is the change in the, uh, in the, um, uh, investment and production as the price moves across different bands. Um, and so I'm, I'm taking an average over a $20, uh, $20 price range. You can see there that that supply curve is, is relatively steep out at the up, upper end. So the, you know, from the 90 to $110 uh, dollar price range, you get one response. But as you move down that cost curve, down that supply curve, you know, the costs flatten out. And so that's what leads to uh, the statistic that Dan quoted, a $3 uh, impact in a $50 world is the same as a $10 impact in a $100 world, which makes any discount associated with this policy or others that much more impactful. Um, and so it's, uh, it, uh, it, uh, you know, it's a double chilling effect, you, you've heard us say, from the, the dual impact of lower global prices and then a price discount uh, you know, for the U.S. market uh, additive to that. So the, I said we kept with the base and potential production outlooks from our original study. Uh, we put those together as a band to show uh, what possible outcomes there might be. We were tracking before the price uh, decline as we were getting additional data in through 14. Now, we were pretty confident we were tracking at that old price level up along that potential uh, supply curve, uh, maybe even exceeding that potential supply curve. 
as a result of, of the decline in price, we're clearly going to have a response uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the production outlook that we get. IHS's current view I've got here tracks right around that, that base production level. So in order to tie these two studies together, we, we thought that the, uh, the base and potential production cases are, are quite reasonable, and, and we stuck with those. And it really is uh, some moving kind of from that potential down toward the base, but then also it's really the production gains, efficiency gains, um, and the cost cutting, you know, that we're seeing uh, the cost, uh, not uh, the cost reduction by the, um, not so much by the company, but the cost uh, deflation that we're seeing in the service sector that allows us to, uh, it, you know, stay on, on that track. The chart on the left is some analysis we did looking at um, the percent of change in the budgets and the total spend. Um, versus, uh, I think it's a 2013 base. I, I can't quite see uh, that far with my uh, eyesight. Um, but you can see there that, you know, depending on, really the outcome in production really does depend on, on how that spending is, is pulled back. And then also, you know, what kind of cost savings uh, the companies get with that, uh, you know, with that spending. If we get cost deflation in the, uh, in the upstream sector. Uh, so I'll go through the next couple slides, you know, relatively quickly. I won't, I won't get into all the numbers. All these tables and figures are in, in our report that uh, you but can have. Kurt, why don't you at. hit it, I mean, since it is kind of small, hit the main number. A sure. Couple, a few of the main numbers just to tell uh, people what they uh, are. I'll do that. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, I'll flip to my, uh, if, I, if you give me just a second to get to the right page, I've got it here. But uh, anyway, so the circle, uh, the numbers, you know, that uh, I pointed out in a previous slide. So. 124,000 jobs in the supply chain, 394 in the in the uh, in the overall broader impact. You know the numbers that I talked about before, and then it's similar numbers, similar ratios with the potential case. So you know we were pushing up close to uh, you know well over 900,000 jobs total impact in the potential production case from the original study. About 240,000 of those that are in the actual actual supply chain. And you can see there, um, you know the impacts. Uh, uh, you know, start out big at, at, in the beginning and then taper a little bit as the, uh, as the economic model um, uh, you know, reaches equilibrium again. But it does have an impact really over the full, full time frame. Um, domestic uh, GDP, we talked about, you know, $25 billion just in the supply chain, uh, $86 billion in the, in the total economy. Potential case, uh, you know, 47 and, and 107, 107 billion. So, and again, all this is just from the policy change. This is just from lifting the policy, uh, you know, making the change, and just to the oil sector, right, as, as Dan alluded to. And then gov government revenues that are quite impressive, um, you know, because of the, uh, uh, the, you know, the federal taxes, you know, 333, uh, <clears throat> sorry, billion. In uh, in uh, federal taxes adding up to you know 428 billion in the uh, in the base case and you know pushing again close to close to 900 uh, million in the uh, in the um, in the uh, potential case so substantial amount of government income that uh, you know that comes uh, com comes from this so I'll talk just. A little bit about this, some of the state uh, impacts here. This is uh, just a heat map that shows uh, of the supply chain uh, benefits, kind of where they where they reside. Some are, you know, quite intuitive. Texas, uh, for example, some are less intuitive, like North Dakota. Um, but you know, North Dakota again, we're looking at just the supply chain, uh, not the not the overall uh, impact. States like Texas, of course, benefit from having both. You know, a lot of production as well as uh, a lot of the uh, suppliers and a lot of the industry that supports the, uh, the you know, the production side. You know, states like New York uh, show up on here, uh, you know, despite having uh, a drilling ban on, uh, on, on, on fracking in New York. The financial services sector that fund a lot of this, uh, a fair bit of high tech. Uh, if you get kind of down in and start looking a little more granular, database management, big data, some of the visualization technology, uh, some of those companies are, uh, you know, based in New York. New York's also benefiting from some of the logistics kind of across the border in Pennsylvania, uh, trucking companies, welders, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and so, you know, New York is a beneficiary. Dan mentioned, you know, Washington, Oregon, uh, you know, no surprise, high tech, uh, a lot of the software and uh, uh, technology equipment that's, uh, that's supplied into the industry. 
And in Florida, I'm going to get to Florida, Dan. Uh, hold on. I, I got a script here. Uh, working down my slip. So um, California, uh, you know, populous state. Obviously, it has uh, you know substantial crude oil production of its own. It is not actually a tide oil or shale play player uh, for the most part. Uh, but because of its size and because of the technology and the various industries that it, it supports, it's a, you know it's a winner out of this. You know, Illinois um, has has production um, has a fairly sizable. This is the Midwest manufacturing base that, that Dan was talking about. A lot of durable uh, manufacturing, construction equipment. A uh, fair bit of construction equipment goes into you know clearing the pads, making the roads, and. Uh, and so forth, machine tools, some sand uh, that's being supplied from the from the uh, Mississippi River, uh, and just a just a diverse manufacturing base that uh, uh, that uh, plays into Illinois, New York, Ohio, uh, the Marcellus uh, play, Florida is uh, is an interesting one. So if you look at the which sectors, which of these supply chain sectors. Uh, contribute to these uh, to these benefits. We'll take just Texas and Florida, and it's it, first of all, it's kind of interesting that you know Florida is almost half the size of impact. You know, 6,000 supply chain jobs uh, in Florida versus 13,000 and change in, in in Texas, but a much different set of sectors that uh, you, you know that feed into that, right? So Texas, you know, construction and well services, materials, uh, you know, uh, uh, logistics, industrial equipment, machinery pretty diverse pie chart, whereas if you go into Florida, a lot of it is industrial equipment and machinery that's being manufactured, assembled uh, there, some professional services and financial services, uh, you know, very little in materials, obviously almost almost nothing in terms of uh, construction and well services, right? There's no, uh, uh, there's no well service contractors based in Florida, they're based, they're based in Texas. So, um, it just goes to show the the uh, kind of the diversity and the nature of the supply chain uh, once you start looking at at, at the results uh, you know, behind this. Before you leave it, just to make clear again, this is showing these are not the absolute numbers; these are the difference between the two cases uh, in terms of the of the jobs. That's right. Now, absolute That's right. numbers, of course, would be considerably larger. Yeah. So it's the difference between the uh, uh, you know between the, the the two cases between production between uh, free and, and restricted trade. The congressional districts, I don't have time, I don't want to uh, take everybody's time and, and go through each, each congressional district, but uh, yeah, the majority of the, of the congressional districts benefit uh, you know, from this, um, and there's, uh, there's, some, there's some nice nuance in there. If you go to the website, again, and kind of look up your particular district or districts you know, that you're interested in, you can see you know, which sectors and, uh, and, and what the different contributions are from the different uh, uh, parameters. So. Um, one thing I'll come back to real quick, um, and I've, I've got just another, another slide or two, um, was the this this concept and this um, uh, misconception that's still out there today. I still read it uh, from time to time in papers that you know a change in the export policy uh, that allows the U.S. crude oil prices to come up to global prices will somehow have a negative impact on U.S. gasoline prices, right? And there's been a number of studies, including ours, that uh, that refute that. Um, the thing to remember is the U.S. gasoline and refined products is widely traded. You know, the U.S. is now the largest exporter uh, of, of refined products, you know, a net number of something like 3 million barrels a day, uh, including NGLs of, of, uh, of, of exports. Also imports, so we export out of the Gulf Coast, we import gasoline into the East Coast. Very active market that's very closely tied to international, international prices. And so, any change we, that uh, you know that, that we expect from allowing the export of crude oil that would re-equalize you know WTI to Brent or or to to you know U.S. domestic crude prices to international crudes uh, would really have no impact on uh, um, gasoline prices and actually could would likely decrease gasoline prices because of adding additional production, the additional supply of crude o onto the international. International market, and at the same time, we really think the refining industry will remain quite uh, vibrant and, and robust because of cheap natural gas and uh, and the fact that we'll be exporting crude oil and they'll be getting you know an export parity uh, export parity price. 
So to conclude, um, uh, the impact of the export ban, it's, it's really on us today. Um, you know, we've got stocks that are at record levels, and we've got, you know, accrued a WTI to Brent price differential that's, you know, 9 to $10. So it's, it's here today. Um, for all the uh, efforts the BIS made in, in clarifying the condensate export, um, that doesn't appear to be helping. You know, otherwise we, we, you know, we don't see that in the price uh, spreads, you, you know, that we have today. Uh, part of that may be because of the infrastructure required to actually move the, that condensate, uh, process condensate, which has to be kept completely segregated, really to the shoreline to, uh, to, to export. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the lower prices really magnify uh, the, the price discount. This is a d double chilling effect and putting you know, a lot, large number of wells uh, viability in, in, uh, in question. And I guess, you know, just a final point is the infrastructure to export uh, crude oil today is in place. I mean, this is what you might call a shovel-ready project. Um, you know, if we had this policy change, you know, we would, yeah, if the prices were there, the, the price differentials, you know, the, the, the crude, you know, could be exported quite, uh, uh, quite quickly. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. I, the, just the, the, the link to the website for, for anybody who um, d doesn't have it. Again, it's the report, the appendixes are there, as well as a link to this web tool that, uh, that we mentioned. And hopefully we've got enough copies for everybody. We, uh, we've got some uh, copies outside, um, so pick up Dude, one. Why don't you just read the website? Oh, okay, sorry. So it's www.ihs.com slash crude oil supply chain, all one word. Okay. So, uh, Kurt talked about the double chill, or what you call the double whammy that comes from both the low prices and then the impact of the export ban. And so we want to just take a couple of minutes before we open it up to explore it. And I'm going to just ask uh, Rick Bott uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Frank introduced him. He's acting as a senior advisor to us. Uh, as uh, uh, Frank said, he'd had a lot of experience in the independent sector. I can't remember if you mentioned uh, also in the independent sector in India because he ran the largest uh, independent in India that uh, went from producing nothing to producing 25% of uh, India's oil. However, we're not going to talk about India. We're going to talk about the United States. And first, just uh, Rick, say a word about it kind of, if you put your old hat on as an independent, kind of how you looked at the supply chain before and after this study, how you look at it now. Sure, Dan. Well, I think, if you can hear me, I think um, yeah, hopefully the benefit of my 30-plus years of international experience will help give you some, some context about what the industry looks like now. Um, I think a lot of us view it as the wildcatter who's out there taking big risks and doing new things, and certainly that is important to unlock and discover new resources to supply the energy for the, for the global um, economies. But what has really become, due to um, a couple of factors I'll talk about, but a trem the tremendous advances in the industry, the real value and all this growth that um, Dan and Kurt talked about in terms of U.S. production has really come from a very efficient industrial process. And the now the well pad, the work out in the field, is really also become, due to a lot of the models that the independent the independents use as well as the supply chain has really become the R&D laboratory, if you will, because every well is a little bit different and you're engineering these things um, to continue to improve on the efficiency, the cost, uh, and the environment and reduce the environmental impact. So it's a very, very, very dynamic process. And it is really, at the, as you take it up to the highest level, it's based on the two key dynamics, I think, and there's been over the past years um, a lot of discussion about the technology dynamic, but I think what this report does, even maybe as a surprise to the producer type companies, is it really gave us, uh, takes an in-depth view of all of the intertwining, interconnected, interdependent um, resources that are brought to bear that ends up in that well pad. So, you know, we used to drill, I mean, these wells cost between five and eight million dollars to drill and complete them. Um, and we used to think about single wells. Now we, everything is done on a well pad when at least in the development phase. And so now we're talking about four and eight wells standard, but a lot of these things are now happening at 20 and 30 wells. So four times, you know, eight times 
uh, eight is $64 million, add a little bit of infrastructure, you're in 75 to $80 million of investment in that one area. Um, and so an opportunity for a lot of continued ingenuity. So I think the point of that is that that, um, that uh, supply chain dynamic is really kind of one of the driving forces that has allowed this uh, revolution to take place, whether it's in oil or in gas, and has really unlocked the supply. So U.S. is now able to compete because of technology, not necessarily because we had the best reservoirs. Certainly the conventional reservoirs are much better, but we have this technology advantage that we've developed and it allows us then to compete. And so um, that supply chain dynamic is really critical to that. Hopefully that just gives you some experience about how that reinforces um, kind of what the experts are here telling you when they roll it up to a macro level. So the second thing, because you know the community very well, the producer community, uh, how's the mentality change from, say, early November, <laughs> the worldview? Well, the worldview has probably changed drastically. Um, I think that it really, the perception, if you will, the, the mindset of the producer is really depends on probably two key factors. First of all is whether or not um, the quality of their inventory and that's going to help them with the long-term view. And the second one is really a short-term, and that's how well they're hedged. So how much pain are they enduring right now? Um, but that's going to translate into critical decisions that everybody's wrestling with about how do you reduce cost. And the first is going to be looking at focus. So you're going to focus on that high-value, um, low-cost inventory that you have. Um, and then the second one is going to be how do I get these costs out of this truck, how to, out of the system? And the first place you turn is the supply chain. So the supply chain takes the immediate brunt of that um, cutback because when, as, as you just look at the numbers Kurt talked about, uh, the, the supply chain brings critical technology, critical um, innovation, uh, the, the labor force is tremendous that they bring, the logistics, the infrastructure, the materials, and that, that expertise is brought by the supply chain. So I'll just give you a, kind of one number is that there's, on the well pad, there's probably a handful to a dozen producer employees, but there are hundreds and hundreds of supply chain employees that are out there actually doing the work. And so that's the place that they look, you know, to, 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 to for cutbacks in the, in the initial phase. What is a hierarchy of cutbacks? I mean, just as once you've done that cutting, where do you? Well, I would say you probably look at, uh, the way I would look at it is you look at sort of the three big buckets. The first big bucket is what is discretionary and growth. So that would be your exploration type efforts. That's de-risking your new plays. That is your land leasing. And of course, then there's all the internal GNA, all the people that you're paying for within on your own payroll. And you're looking at that because that is the thing that has the least near-term impact to your profits. Secondly is when you start to cut into the meat, and that is the development. That is uh, what resources you are out there choosing to drill. And again, that's kind of focusing on what you have that's really good. So you're moving to your core, you're moving to what's low cost and what's highly productive. And then probably when you, as you continue to cut, depending on what your, your future view is, you'll then start cutting into the real meat, which is producing capex, um, producing opex, and, uh, and just, just well maintenance and things like that. Just to get a handle on th that difference of that um, discount, if because of the discount, people cut more than they would cut otherwise, uh, I mean, and I think it's a big question for everybody, how quickly, if you can generalize, do you respond when the market starts to improve again? I mean, some people think, you know, now sort of think the U.S. responds, twit turns on a dime. Yeah, I think that's a hopeful expectation. I don't know that it turns on the dime. It certainly turns on the dime on the way down. And again, it comes back to those perspectives of how the <coughs> producer views the future. And so the cuts will come very quickly. A lot of people are still, and that's why you see storage and uncom uncompleted wells continuing to ramp up on inventory because people are still optimistic that it won't be that deep of a downturn. When it becomes a deep downturn, those cuts are very, very deep. 2008 is a great example. Most drillers went from 20, 30, 40, 50 rigs to less than 10. So that cut happened in, depending on how long-term their contracts were, that happened in six to eight months. The challenge then for us as we started to get better price signals to come bring that back on was probably 18 to 24 months to be able to hire the people, move them back, get the logistics going, and get everything back into the field. So it's, uh, it's quite a lot of an uh, intensive process to try to build back up. Those workers go away. I think that underlines uh, the kind of urgency that exists in this current price environment 
Uh, Frank, we'll turn it back to you now. Thank you. And thanks for excellent presentation. So I'm going to actually, uh, we've teed up a couple of folks to start this discussion, uh, although I suspect that you're not going to need a lot of stimulation to get things going. Um, let me ask just two quick questions. So um, Rick, I guess the first one to you. So uh, downturn, upturn. I mean, one of the things we're hearing from some of the, the independents, right, is that in a lot of cases, um, They've cased the wells, haven't fracked the wells. So our, our estimate of inventory is above ground inventory. There actually might be more inventory below ground, right? And I've been using the um, analogy of the, the, oh, I guess the bus boy, right? So they're opportunistic to the extent they have people in the field and the, the rigs are still operating, that when the glass gets half full and there's more opportunity to fill supply, some of this stuff can come back relatively quickly if they've, if they've got the right balance sheet and the people in place, right? So that's the first piece. The, the downturn, it strikes me, depending on whether you start, you know, last summer, I would argue that this is different from 2008 just because of the unconventionals, right? Mm -hmm. And we saw a lot of this in the natural gas. Production held by lease, you kept producing to keep it going, and then the question is, right, you hope that the price comes back at some point. But we got down to gas prices of like a buck eighty nine, which didn't make a lot of sense. And at some point, the, you decide which resource to keep in the ground, which resource to produce, what you do with condensate. So I mean, the analogies that we draw, whether it's to eighty six or two thousand eight, aren't we in a bit of different space? Yeah, that's a very very good point, and that goes to uh, Dan's earlier question about how long it takes to cut and how long it takes right. to come back. Um, you're exactly right in that um, the 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 unconventionals has really changed the game. And while you can stop drilling very, very quickly, um, and you have a very steep decline, much more so than conventional wells. And so, but the more production that the U.S. builds, the more, I'll call it maintenance capex that you need just to keep that production flat. And that, of course, impacts, that's sort of that middle area that I was talking about where you would cut. You don't really want to cut that because that's really hard to bring it back. Um, but it is different in that, a lot of the 2008 was economically driven. This is really more of a supply driven, uh, sorry, yes, su oversupply driven because um, all this technology and then the supply chain dynamics has then allowed us to be com become competitive and use technology to produce these resources that, that other countries haven't been able to produce yet. So it kind of puts the U.S. In, in, in that game. And on the research side, and I know we've got folks like Roger and Lee and Bill Icorn and other people here that can talk about this for their companies, but are we drilling research wells anymore? I mean, at some point, you me? yeah, no. I mean, no. <laughs> okay, you want to be brief about that? Or, yeah. <laughs> Just say which company you're from. Pioneer Natural Resources. Yeah. Done with research. Done with research. Because yeah, we're now we, at the bone we we're, we were into the development mode. We spent a lot, of, a lot of time and money and energy on research uh, over the three or four years. And use the mic. <laughs> okay. We, we spent a lot of time and energy and money on research uh, three or four years, uh, past three or four years, but we've announced even last year before the, uh, the downturn that we were really moving into the development phase and the Permian. And we really have two just essential uh, assets that are very active, the Permian and the Eagleford. Okay. And then for Kurt, and then we'll turn it open, um, on refining. So, uh, Dan, you talked about stocks and U.S. stocks, and clearly we're at 85-year high levels as far back as we've actually been recording. But internationally, we're also high. And so my thought is at some point when we – and we talked about this last time on, on quality, um, not just volume, but on quality, that as we produce a lot more light oil, it strikes me that, that the Angolans, the Algerians, the Nigerians that we've displaced from the U.S. that have now found new markets, presumably in Asia, um, at lower prices, they're under pressure to keep producing and selling too. So if they discount and we discount, now we have transport, how much more light oil gets into the market to displace? I think IEA, um, EIA was using 30 percent of global supply now is light, relatively, and 15 percent of refining capacity is light. So investments can be made. And I talked to Joanne Shore be <laughs> before he came down here. So the refining side, they would argue that there's there's capability out there as well as additional to absorb it. Um, but yeah. but isn't there a, a global marketplace out there as well that has some limitations? Yeah. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. So, you know, when 
folks say that there's refining capacity in the U.S. to refine more light tide oil. That's, that's absolutely correct, but there's a price signal that has to go with that, right? And so, you know, we looked at this really as tiers, right? And the, the first tier, in, from the U.S. perspective, mm -hmm. the first tier was to displace the similar light sweet crudes, right? We did that quite quickly. Um, and then the next tier was to, um, you know, displace some of the lighter uh, imported barrels that were sour but also fairly light, right? And then you kind of work your way up through the refining system that we, that, that, you know, that we articulated. But each one of those steps has some economic penalty associated right. with it, right? And we think today we're in our tier three out of four, effectively. And tier four is quite painful because tier four, you actually have to derate the refinery. You can't actually run as much crude in it. Um, the international market, you know, is, is an interesting one because um, there is um, additional markets out there for light sweet crude. I mean, the whole uh, European refining system uh, was built, or a large portion of it was built around North Sea crude um, that was produced at, you know, much higher rates than it is today. They reconfigured into, you know, the sour Urals barrels, but they still have a lot of flexibility to run some more sweet. Um, they actually don't need a lot of the real rich naphtha molecules that are actually in it. So they actually the best, um, you know, after you put some barrels into Europe, um, actually the best market is actually Euro Asia um, from a quality perspective uh, because they need the naphtha molecules. They have a, you know, growing gasoline demand and also a very vibrant uh, naphtha-based petrochemical industry uh, that, you know, that need, needs those barrels. So the other thing is, is that, um, I mean, the refinery at the end of the day is just the, you, you build the refinery uh, to match demand with supply. Um, you know, you've got a certain demand for products and you've got a certain crude that, you know, you, you know it's whatever Rick found when he punched a hole in the ground or uh, Pioneer found when they punched a hole in the ground and you, you build the refining system to match that, right? So if it's, if it's heavy sour Venezuelan crude, you build a very sophisticated refinery with a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of capital to, to upgrade it. If you find light tide oil, it, it, it's something smaller. But in Asia, um, the advantage they have is they're building new refineries, right? And so they can build those refineries specifically for the crude that's there today, whether that be Angolan or, um, you know, or U.S., right? right? Of course, yeah. that may mean that we rationalize and take out some of the European refineries that also would violate, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I, it's a complex thing. So um, just for the purpose of discussion, on April 2nd, we're actually going to do a little refining 101 and an exports piece after that because we need to discuss this. We're getting to the point now where, where the quality is important. The volume has been so stark, the increase that's coming out of the ground. How do you accommodate that? And then when you look at certainty, of investment climate because you don't want this to be a stranded right. investment. Right. You want right. to be able to operate right. this for a while. The economics of the input and the economics of the output looking at product demand globally is really important. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, – you made a very key point there, Frank, and that is the policy certainty, yeah. right, and the stranded investments, right, because um, what we see today really is a, is a gridlock between the upstream and the downstream where essentially, you know, every barrel of new production that comes on needs a barrel of refining investment to go with it, right? But that refining investment oftentimes relies on, at least in part, a discounted crude price in order to make that economic, uh, make that uh, investment economic, particularly if it's a fairly simple condensate uh, processing. So, you know, the, the, the upstream's relying on the downstream, the downstream's kind of relying on the upstream or the market to be oversupplied. And so you, you get this gridlock that retards, in our, our opinion, the, the investment uh, in, in both industries, Absolutely. right? It's not that we won't eventually get there, but it's suboptimal. Well, on the whole notion on the foreign policy benefits that you talked about, you know, we can't really tell other com countries that we want them to produce if we're not producing and exporting as well. And then we may bring in more of a certain kind of crude, export more product, yeah. export excess crude. Now we have Mexico coming up. The market is yeah. dynamic, yeah. going to change. Yeah, for 40 years, the United States has been telling other countries we should have free flow of <laughs> energy trade and free flow of investment. And oops, it turns out that. Uh, uh, we have this little obstacle ourselves. Absolutely. Um, one slight note. I, so I've been saying, and I would argue, that uh, Saudi increases helped offset the loss of Iranian. U.S. light wouldn't have replaced Iranian. Yeah. But that's, we're nitpicking yeah. now. Yeah. Um, Senator Johnson, so we talked about this whole thing about how the EPCA got started and this policy that we thought we were running out. You want to give a little historical context on where you are now? Had we known if G USGS told us different things in the 70s? 
we might be in a different place. It really was not debated very much in the 70s, sort of taken for granted. It was not a big deal to uh, restrict exports. I mean, uh, we didn't talk about it very much at that time. Let, let me make a couple of points, if I may. Uh, uh, first of all, CSIS has done a wonderful job, and IHS and Sarah and Kevin and the rest of you, on researching this question. The case is overwhelming. The arguments against doing exports are bogus. I mean, it's going to raise the price of gasoline. That's been totally disproven. It's going to, the independent refiners are going to have to lay off people. All that is just, everybody who knows anything about this subject knows that's not so. Uh, and yet, we look at what is the status of this legislation at the present time. Well, they had a good hearing on Thursday. Ryan Lance, who is a wonderful spokesman, made a great case and, and others. And, uh, but they're just, uh, you know, over in the House, you've got a Foreign Relations Subcommittee who's considering a bill. You don't even have a bill introduced in the, uh, in the Senate. Why is that if this is an overwhelming case if the national interest is strong, why is it? Well, let me tell you about members <laughs> and money. <laughs> I hope I don't offend anybody or, or, or shock you. But members think about campaign contributions all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, this is a fight between independents and producers. Now, how would you like to buy at, uh, uh, at, uh, Brent, at WTI prices and sell at Brent prices? $10 difference. That's what they're doing. 10 bucks difference. Can you imagine the amount of money? Well, you, yes, you can. The, the amount of money involved. Now, you've got a member who's pro-oil, but he's pro independence and he's pro producer so what does he do he says you know this i mean yeah refining uh so what does he do he says we need to study this you know we need to have some more hearings uh because we want to be sure that the price of gasoline does not go up we don't want to lose any jobs in refining and that's where we are right now. You don't even have a bill introduced in the Senate. And that's the way, in my judgment, it's going to be for the rest of this Congress. It's just too easy to do that. You don't want to pick sides between two of your friends. Now, what would you do? Well, I know what I would do if I were running the Energy Committee right now. I would, I would find a way, and I think there are ways to have a half a loaf, a three quarters of a loaf, and I got some language that would do that, <laughs> but on my own, not on, on behalf of anybody else. But I think that's really what needs to be discussed. I've, I've shared that with Ryan Lance um, because it just ain't going to happen now. Sir, we are being webcast. You realize that? Uh, I do now. <laughs> <laughs> the, did we miss a window of kind of February, January, February, March, the prices are low. Some people feel they bought them. The refinery maintenance has been strung out a little bit more. But now we're going to be into the gasoline driving season in the not too distant future. The politics of, of gasoline prices, you know, inching their way back upward. Is, is that such a big consideration that no one will touch this? No, I don't think it's, I don't think that's it. I mean, the, you know, the spread uh, makes a difference. But it's it's basically that politics of refiners versus producers and your districts and you no, yeah and uh i mean that that's just the way it is and they're just ways to avoid it by continuing to study it okay lee i wanted to tee you up to talk about the independent perspective i'm not sure i want to follow senator johnson <laughs> Uh, I, I, obviously, from our standpoint, uh, we're wholly committed to the need to try to expand the export market. Now, 
how do you do that in this environment, political environment? Uh, that's the that's the huge challenge. Uh, I would add to what Senator Johnston said in in the sense that the other dynamic you've got in this case is that you do have authority within the administration to make changes that could expand exports. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to do it all at one time. It can peel the onion. It can. It has done some of that. We've seen the uh, provisions on allowing for condensates to be exported. Uh, there's a swap possibility from PMEX that's, I think, under consideration. Each of those incrementally move the process forward. Uh, when we are dealing with this issue um, in, a, in the political arena, I think the two issues that we tend to see uh, get the most attention on the one hand, which is negative to us, is uh, gasoline price fear. Um, there's just a lot of people that don't want to jump into that dynamic, and it can be for, for both the reasons of not wanting to deal with that consumer backlash if prices go up and uh, the constituent dynamic that they're dealing with. On the flip side of it uh, is the uh, international uh, uh, security, international energy security play, which uh, draws a lot more appeal among uh, both Democrats and Republicans, I think, uh, to uh, see us in a role that can be uh, a value to our uh, allied countries. Uh, the question then is how do you, how do you uh, develop that aspect of it in a much more um, cogent and, and active way? Uh, I think the studies that are coming out are excellent. Uh, they keep making those points. Uh, we'll see what happens with the Iranian negotiations because uh, clearly that could either mean that there's further constraint on Iranian production or substantial uh, potential for Iranian production to come back in the market, which would have a, a further suppression and a very devasta potentially devastating one. So we're trying to essentially keep the uh, forward motion, uh, slow that it may be at this point in time, going uh, by uh, educating people on gasoline prices being based on international marketplace, not U.S., that uh, refineries are going to be a continuing part of the uh, U.S. manufacturing pool, and and this is not a threat to their employees, and it's not a threat. Uh, in fact, it may even enhance their need to expand. Uh, and then to look at the uh, benefits that the country gains by getting uh, into the uh, energy security world internationally in a way that uh, both helps the U.S., uh, but also can uh, help our allied uh, and, and friendly nations. While we're on that topic, uh, so this is Lee Fuller from IPAA. Just so oh, I should have said that. I suppose, okay. yeah. um, Kevin Book. So um, while you're moving the microphone down, I, one question: Since Lee, you opened up the international side, prices stayed in a band because there was concern about how much demand was robust in 2010 to 2013. But then the geopolitical risk: we we took three million barrels a day offline from the Syria, Iran, Iraq, Nigeria, Venezuela, Libya, right? If some of those were to come back, or if there's a deal with Iran that adds 500,000 barrels a day of production or Libya stabilizes, we continue to have an oversupplied market. So there's still got to be price pressure to keep oil prices lower, which means net back for U.S. producers are still lower. And I'm going to ask you guys to weigh in on this as well. Well. So uh, the Iran deal is, uh, as you say, 300, 500,000 barrels. Libya's half a million barrels blinking on and off like a bad light bulb. Uh, <laughs> these are not easy times to make good price forecasts. But one thing that's clear is that inventories are at all-time highs. Uh, so you know what down looks like if any of this blinks back on. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, there were a couple of points I'd, I'd want to touch also that sure. I can think of no better person than the, the senator from Louisiana. Uh, to talk about this sort of conflict. Louisiana is a state uh, which has about 2.67% of domestic uh, onshore oil production, about 18% of refining capacity. Um, there are two senators, both Republicans, from the state of Louisiana right now. I'm not that, I mean, not there's anything wrong with Republicans, sir. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, one of them is running for governor, and he has not weighed in on this issue uh, at all. Uh, probably very savvy to his local politics. The other, recently elected to the Senate, uh, Senator Cassidy, has six years before he has to go back to the voters, uh, has taken a strong stance in favor of the upstream. When we look at your study, uh, Dan, this is, this is the sort of thing, this is, I love this stuff because I, I love getting into the decision processes 
of politicians, the data that inform those decisions. And uh, there, there is, as, as Ben mentioned, there's a policy debate going on right now by people on the Hill who are moving slowly. And why, why are they moving slowly when they can see all this hardship? Well, part of the problem is that there's 10 states responsible for about 94% of onshore production. Uh, and if you look at who the senators are who represent those states, there's a couple of them from California who apparently uh, aren't big fans of oil production in California's widely diversified economy. Uh, if you look at uh, two data points we have now, it's sort of in the last month. Uh, on February uh, 18th, 21 senators signed a letter uh, Senator Murkowski put out saying, let's uh, treat Mexico the same as Canada. Of those 21 senators, 14 were from producer states. Uh, seven had some sort of ideological disposition that probably took them there. One of them is Marco Rubio, who's probably running for president, so we'll count six, but it's still pretty good. Uh, what wasn't in that number, there were producer state Democrats who didn't decide to sign the letter, most notably Michael Bennett, who uh, is from Colorado, 3% of GDP comes straight from the upstream, why is he, when he's facing re-election, not picking a side on this yet? I don't know. Maybe there's some partisan pressure there. Uh, last Thursday, the hearing that uh, the senator mentioned, a uh, very uh, strong set of uh, comments from seven Republicans, uh, all from producer states, uh, and one Democrat uh, who was kind of cautiously for export, Senator Manchin, from a 29 basis point of U.S. onshore production producer state, West Virginia, uh, and you start to think, well, this is where the supply chain argument starts to come in here. I mean, if, if the decision processes are all about what's in the ground at home, and they're only looking at the upstream, then their decisions are pretty rational in terms of their caution, uh, in terms of their, their unwillingness to engage this political uh, firestorm uh, in, in perception, maybe not fact. Uh, and so it starts to make sense. Just uh, one, uh, one final point, though, about I think where you started, Frank. Dan began with the, the economic arguments, right? He started with the economic case, and then he moved to foreign policy. Uh, the debate on Capitol Hill started with the economic arguments, and it, too, has now moved to foreign policy. I think, I think Lee is absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right, uh, Dan, that this is, this is going to be something that resonates much more with folks uh, as the debate goes there. So I think it'll be very interesting to see how it evolves uh, now that that layer has been added as well. No, so we're um, we're not out of the woods yet, Frank. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, we think uh, for all the countries you mentioned and the supplies that might come back into the market, um, there's kind of an opposite list of things that could go wrong right. as they as on any, uh, on, on any given day. Um, yes, yeah, so we're looking closely at you know not only the break evens but the the market sentiment, the willingness of uh, Wall Street and others to fund, um, you know, the, the, the producers in the U.S., but, uh, you know, we think it's going to be a pretty tough, you know, pretty tough year, um, you, know, you, you know, going forward, for sure. Yeah, I just add one, one quick point then to Kurt's point. What really changed, yes, the price um, signals were, were heading downward, but what really changed is that to Kevin's point, there was that a geopolitical decision or geo, uh, global macroeconomic decision by OPEC to abandon price and go for market. So now you're in the first time probably in 40 years, you're in an, you're in an environment where you have a free market um, accepting these sorts of constraints. And so, and U.S. producers have been able to compete up until now, and it is that technology and that supply chain that is driving this whole, these are the dynamics that are making this work for us. I love the point, that's exactly right. The, the supply chain will bear the brunt, but they will also receive the benefit. And as Dan's initial points there, that reaches all parts of the country that we never thought about. So this intertwined, interdependent um, system uh, has got incredible levels of technology, I mean, as, as Kurt said, I mean, to, to the producer, we see, you know, um, it's, fairly trans, it's fairly simple to us. We see maybe the first tier, maybe the second tier. And I think one of his authors counted up 50 independent tiers within one or one section. So it's so complex and reaches so much of the, of the country that I think that's probably the critical point. But the whole point here is that if America has become competitive because of the technology and because of the sup supply chain, um, it's a competitive environment. Let's get real. It is competitive for, for that price. And more supply is going to bring prices down. 
the way to be more competitive is to not have an additional burden, an additional handicap of a differential that is artificially induced. It's artificially imposed, and you have that choice whether or not you remove it in five years, but as Kurt's report shows, a lot of this benefit really takes off in the next five years. We really have an opportunity here with a lot of the benefit that if you look at that report in terms of the time frame from it. So that's sort of the, uh, and he bracketed it well. You've got the, what's the size of the prize? That's his potential case. But what are the jobs at risk? That's his base case. So that brackets it really well in terms of production, in terms of investment, in terms of resources, in terms of jobs. It's very, very well bracketed by that. So I think it gives you so you can go away and study that. It gives you the independent look, and it shows you how intertwined and complex and uh, how far-reaching. I was very, very surprised that it's an inter interesting little fact I saw in there that, that North Carolina is going to benefit, benefit tremendously because of all the transport, all the trucking, and all of, all of those industries that go through and operate through there. So it's just you'd never think that's pretty far away from North, De North Dakota and Texas oil fields. So it is interesting as a way to just conceptualize it that – you know, if you go back to 2005, we were importing 60% of our oil, and the only question was what rate was U.S. oil imports going to go up to? And then, basically, we said technology, disruptive technology, just took the U.S. from being uncompetitive to making the U.S. very competitive. Uh, and it's kind of a useful way to con uh, conceptualize it. I know there are other comments. I'd just like to leave a question at some point to come back to Kevin on the foreign policy. If we're kind of be a little more precise, Will it, do you think on the foreign policy side, it's mainly the, the stalemate about around Ukraine and what to do about Russia is the main foreign policy issue that highlights the, the disadvantages of the ban from a political point of view? Where you have a test case, Dan, is that the, the Ukraine issue provided a catalyst for the, the Congress to embrace the idea of LNG exports and projecting diplomatic force through energy. Uh, that, was, that was really the, the prototype. And there's many differences, of course, between gas and, and, and oil, the way it's seen here in our policy framework, as well as politically. Um, Russia's role as a producer, I don't think yet is fully understood politically. Uh, I don't think its power, its westward hegemony over Europe uh, on, a, on an oil and products basis is properly internalized. I don't think that, uh, I mean, I think people are starting to get that lower prices hurt Russia a lot, but uh, they're not necessarily thinking about the same way as they were about gas yet. I also think there's a separate piece, right? So there's a difference on the foreign policy side between making a consistence on free trade policy and when we ask other people, whether it's Saudi Arabia or someone else, to increase production, that we ought to be willing to put that in the market in that secure kind of crude. I think where people tend to go uh, overboard a little bit is the leverage piece on the bottom. We're still a, a net importer, right? Uh, and we'll probably continue to be, and we have a certain kind of oil. If we want to use the SPR, different set of circumstances, but that's a whole different discussion. But, but from a volume basis, and I, um, while I appreciate the point, I, you know, as a nation, we don't seem to want other countries to use uh, energy trade as foreign policy leverage. I'd hate to see us say, well, we will give it to country X, but not country Y, right? So we want to supply it to a global market. That's fine, because we've had hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, and we need supply from everywhere when that happens. So I just think we need to be a little bit more open mind. But let me, let's open this up, because we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, we only have a few rules. Uh, one is that you have a mic, so find a mic close to you. Identify yourself and your affiliation. And you can make a comment, but if you want to ask your question in the form of a question, that would be helpful while we have this group here. So please, go ahead. Hi, it's Emily Meredith from Energy Intelligence, and my question is just, um, you brought up Senator Manchin's comments from the hearing last week, and he brought up this, oh, sorry, he brought up this idea of, like, maybe there's some kind of trigger mechanism we could put in place that would be an effective policy for, you know, reforming exports without going all the way. What do you guys think of that? Is there, is there, a, is there a way that something like that could work as an incremental step, or does that seem tough? <laughs> Well, I think two things. One, it, it, it introduces even more uh, indecision into the investment process and uncertainty. And secondly, I think you get you, uh, I mean, the sentiment is well respected, but the practice gets you even more into the regulatory pretzel. Well, maybe. Right. I think there are ways to do it. Yeah, I think there are some. 
Hi, I'm Bob Linden from uh, Pace Global Consulting. There seem to be two elephants in the room that we're ignoring. Uh, one concerns the dimensions of the domestic debate, and the other concerns the changing circumstances of international oil and, and pricing and production dynamics. Uh, on the domestic debate, uh, we've ignored the, the carbon coalition and the, the pervasive impact they have on decisions at, at, by the administration on oil exports, uh, the Keystone XL pipeline, which was accused of being an export tool, uh, and other things. And uh, it just doesn't seem to me that looking at produce, producers versus refiners captures all the elements of the debate. And I'll step back here if, as long as I'm allowed to point out the second elephant. <laughs> well, should we respond? Yeah. So, um, Thank you. Uh, mentioning the Keystone, by the way, just a, a, a factoid, there seems to be this, as you suggest this, uh, people seem to think that the Keystone would be a, an export line. And at least when we do our numbers, at least 70 percent of the supply that would go through the Keystone would be used in the United States, uh, and it would displace oil from Venezuela. I think on the carbon side, I, I mean, others can, no, I don't know if there's anybody here from the administration, but I think on balance, the administration uh, you know, the, the president at the end of March in 2011, I think it was, uh, you know, basically endorsed shale gas, and he certainly talked very positively in several of the last State of the Unions about uh, what's happening and elsewhere about our oil production as well. So I think inter the interest in it, among other things, is for some of the reasons that are in our study, is uh, the job creation has been, uh, has been so important. Yeah, the, the, well, let me just, I agree that that's an offsetting consideration, but there, there, there's a rather adamant no carbon movement in this country that I think has some valid points, but I, I'm generally on the other side of the issue, um, that I, I don't think is going away. Um, the second elephant uh, is on international supply management and pricing. Uh, I keep hearing people say that OPEC decided not to uh, cut production. And as a matter of fact, it was Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states that decided they were not going to cut production. And part of that was directed at, you know, generally the non-OPEC production levels coming up as real high prices, and that, of course, highlighted the United States. But the other side of it is the, the Sunni Shiite geopolitical part of uh, battle that's going on, and the Iranian negotiations with the you know the Western powers about uh, about their military uh, nuclear program, and I it's my belief that in the first time in my 40 years in the in the business that we've seen a break a, re a clear break in OPEC, and we're no no longer going to have this this uh, leveling mechanism. Um, now we can take that to say that that has some implications for U.S. producers, and I've been telling to, trying to tell that to my parent company, and, but um, it also has produce implications internationally. And when you think about nuclear policy and what all this might mean, that's that's beyond the scope of this discussion. But clearly, I think we've had a break, a breach in, in OPEC. Uh, uh, diplomatic norms among the, amongst the membership that we haven't seen, well, in the history of OPEC. And I was wondering about comments on that. So we're going to take a couple of questions. I, I think that the administration's position has changed. Uh, Kevin and I have done a lot on give a little, take a little. And I would say that 2011, we were in a certain place. I think we've moved beyond that place now. Natural gas was helpful, uh, but they're going to ratchet down on fossil fuels and ratchet up on emissions commitments, right? Um, and the second piece, I totally agree with you. I, it's Saudi Arabia, no other country, non-OPEC, OPEC, came with an offer to cut production, and they decided that this wasn't worth it. And they believe that there's um, higher-priced production and lower-priced production, and that lower-priced producers ought not subsidize higher-priced producers, if I can get that accurately. Um, let me go ahead. Sarah and Bill ask questions, and then we'll try to combine them. This is Sarah Vakshiri from SVB Energy International. My question is about condensate. Um, do you think that like a lower, uh, 
they could like see this as a solution that like lower grade of like higher crude oil would be exported just like vis-a-vis -vis the policies of Iran. I mean, now Iran is it, it's not anymore following the policy of producing crude oil and exporting crude oil. They're building small refineries in Yemen and Iraq for their crude. I mean, their crude oil, but they're having the priority of expanding their condensate production. I mean, they recently uh, inaugurated phase 12 of South Pars. They're having 170,000 uh, barrels per day extra of condensate, and they're going to look for expanding their condensate. Even in their massive energy plan, they're looking in exporting condensate to Mexico to blend with their heavy oil. It might not be practical, but that's what they're looking in their grand strategies is this going to be something to consider for U.S. Uh, crude oil? Well, I was going to make three three quick points and 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 maybe ask for observations about them. Um, the three are this technology. I think one of the things that struck me about what Rick said earlier is, you know, look, production of light tight oil is in its infancy relatively speaking. You know, look at what was learned about shale gas development in, in over the last decade and a half versus light tight oil, which is basically five years in. And, you know, the production returns, the, the yield curves on, on um, light tight oil are, there's room to grow. And I think that one of your points was that one of the places that to be cut back is on the technology development. I think that's an incredibly important point. Secondly, timing. Senator Johnson talked about members naturally sort of wanting to defer the decision. When I think right now, the question is, why not now? And, and I think this is where this, this study comes in and why it's so important. Thirty years ago, when I was a young staffer at the Senate and sitting behind your, your dais, uh, Senator, um, it, it, you know, we tended to divide the world in terms of consuming states and producing states. And what that map that you showed earlier, why it's so important, is that basically so many more states are now producing states. I mean, some are actually producing the energy, but when you look at the technology, you know, California, North Carolina, Florida, Texas, you know, you, you can look and, and you look at Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, all these, these different states that were traditionally in the consuming arena only are now really producers. And I think that's the key political point, but you combine that with the opportunity going forward to change the dynamic of the United States as an energy producer with technology development. We stay in the lead. We stay in the lead in many, many respects because of that. So I'll just ask people to comment on that. Okay, we'll take one other question. Thank you. Uh, great study. and. Uh, I'm uh, to be commended for putting out anything that, that tries to, to do any forward-looking analysis of the U.S. Uh, oil market at this point. My question is related to that. It's, it's on price, the price assumptions that uh, underpin uh, these two cases. Uh, and a related kind of point is how much of the discount, the WTI Brent discount, do you attribute to the export restrictions and how much to, to others? I mean, do, 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 does the re I haven't read the report, but does it, does it take the discount... Uh, to zero, does it does it equalise Brent and LLS? Is that how you, is that how you get to the, to the to the kind of two different scenarios? And one, I guess, observation is, you know, that these are compelling uh, conclusions for the differential between export case, non-export case, uh, through the supply chain. I was wondering, at, at, at any point in the study, did you did you look at the the effects of the, on the supply chain of of, of the much bigger uh, price uh, differential between where we were this time last year and where we are now? As in the 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 supply chain effects of the of the price collapse seem to by far outweigh anything that we're talking about here, and I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. Okay, uh, so maybe I'll pick up a couple and leave the tough ones for everybody else here. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so your question on condensates, you know, is, is an interesting one because uh, I mean condensates. Uh, we generally think of like South Pars as really a byproduct of the natural gas production, right? And so condensate production and condensate refining um, is, you know, it's, it's somewhat a means to an end. I mean, it, it produces refiners, refine it to make ultimately at the end of the day you want, you know, refined product d demand, right? Uh, but in certain cases we find where 
uh, producers find um, you know it advantageous to focus more on the condensate production versus versus crude oil. Um, I mean, my own thought is is that really an open trade policy for the U.S. is is kind of the best way to go and doesn't put in the regulatory pretzel, if you will, um, in there. I think you were referring maybe to an, an API split, right, of, you know, 51 API you can export, but 49 you can't. Um, that creates a, a whole other series of, of complexities and uh, incentives to blend different products and inefficiencies, if you would, in the system. There's nothing, there's no magical breakpoint kind of between light crude and con condensate. It's just... Uh, uh, just kind of the nature of the the mix of the of the, uh, the molecules that are in there. So, um, yeah, on your question to Brent WTI spread, um, there's a, I mean, there's a couple of different things. I mean, Brent and WTI are not identical, right? So if you put them at the refiner's gate and you said, okay, you know, you can have a cargo of, of Brent and you can have a cargo of WTI, we think WTI is worth about a dollar fifty, dollar seventy more just because of the quality. WTI is a better quality crude than, than 40s, which is the, the stream that sets the, the, the BFOE yeah, price. It used to be the, the split. Yeah. Was, yeah. It's, it's WTI was higher. Right, right, right. Um, and then, of course, you've got logistical differences. WTI sits in the mid in the mid-continent. Um, the end of the day, if you opened up the spigot and allowed exports, we think uh, uh, Brent would be probably two dollars, three dollars higher than the WTI um, in a free market scenario, and that's that's what underlies our um, you know, underlies our study. So, and that's really quality and logistical uh, differences, right? I don't know if I missed anything. I'll go ahead. Well, I was going to say on the price, the, you know, basically the difference between um, you know. Forty-nine and fifty-nine dollars is difference between break-even and not break-even. I mean, when we divide the universe, uh, we did a look at thirty-nine thousand wells in our database, and you saw that um, uh, you know a big spread between those that would be economic at say around fifty and those that are economic at sixty. So it does have an impact on investment. Uh, uh, Bill, your your one point about the map, I was really thinking about it. Because as you, as you said, you know, one needs to see maps producing, consuming, and in a sense, this work really redraws the map and shows you a very different, uh, and a different message. And I think even, as, as you were saying it, that kind of map became more sharply etched in my mind. Kurt, I've got the one quick question. This is a methodology question. So, um, and... Your point raised it, Bill. So it's one of these ideas that um, if oversupply in the domestic market, right, helps widen the spread, mm -hmm. as, you, as you get past the refinery maintenance season into the gasoline season, when presumably you'll want to take more light oil into the refinery and make a higher yield of gasoline, right? So if that compresses, but then the offset seems to me is that the oversupply in the amount of oil that we have in stocks Right, it counteracts right. that a bit. Right. And I'm actually more concerned about the fall, that if refinery maintenance was delayed in the spring and it gets heavier in the fall, just as we may be coming out of this, we have a depressing effect on domestic production right. again. Right, right, yeah, and I think it's, um, even as refineries come out of the maintenance season, it's gonna be a pretty steep climb yeah. to get back. I mean, we've built essentially about a million barrels a day um, of storage since the beginning of the year every day. Um, and our refinery runs, I think last week, uh, were about a million barrels a day below the peak in 14, right? So in theory, if our refineries all came back online and, and we're, we're just now coming out of kind of the, the bottom of the maintenance season, but we've, we've got several more weeks until we get all the refineries back on. If everything comes back on and they all run full, um, we could effectively balance <laughs> it, you know, the market, and that's without any new production increases from, uh, uh, you know, from the upstream sector, right? So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think as we get through um, the driving season and then go back, kind of depending on what happens to uh, the upstream producer right. side, right? To kind of depending on how, um, you know, what we see there, if we start to see, I mean, but we continue to see month after month, right, increases in yeah. production, um, and we think, um, you know, middle of this year, that probably flattens out. But as that graph I showed there, it really depends on a number of factors, you know, both, uh, uh, you know, how much uh, capital spending is, is cut back, how much efficiencies are gained in the cost side of the business. 
um, you know, how bullish Wall Street is uh, in funding companies. Uh, it's, a, you know, how much hedging there is. It's a multidimensional problem, right? But uh, we see markets pretty fundam fundamentally oversupplied uh, going out, you know, six, nine, 12 months. Do you want to yes, sir. answer that technology question? So to your question about the technology and what does that lack of investment do in the supply chain, um, I think it's, it's an interesting point because, yes, you need to look at the flip side of that in terms of where will the supply chain's investment go. And clearly you'll have a sim you will still have a price signal for those guys to try to come up with technologies that will reduce cost and improve efficiency. So that will always be there, but it really comes down to kind of what the size of the prize is and how much investment is put into that. And then the time frame that's expected on a payout, you know, how long are you gonna amortize that for? And so just a couple things, if you think about downhole, I mean, there are some tremendous material science research going on to you're dealing your two miles down and three miles out, you're, you're dealing with some very harsh uh, mechanical and operating environments down there, and so there's a lot of work that goes into that. If you're cutting your wells from 30,000 to 10,000, then that investment that's going to follow that is going to be, you know, two-thirds reduced, or will you pick your number? Um, same, it's been amazing. I, one of the things I'm amazed about it that's happened in the last five years is, is you take a 400-ton rig, and some engineers, some mechanical engineers said, well, what if we can make this thing walk? And so they've developed these incredible walking packages where this rig, 400 tons, can pick up and move in any direction. And because it can do that, that rig time, that move time, and that overall cycle time has come down from two months down to 20, 15 days, really because of that incredible, and it's been iterative. It's over and over and over again with lots of these competitive companies in the supply chain looking at these individual problems, investing in that, putting their money behind it, and solving that problem. And so I think the real risk there is that you, and I don't know that the, certainly the technology that we do and the producer is probably pretty relatively reproducible in other basins around the world, but that supply chain isn't necessarily re reproducible around the world. And so the ability for the U.S. to benefit from that and keep that going in the supply chain not only benefits what we do in the energy industry, but it's benefiting in a lot of those other ancillary applications that I think NASA has been so good at showing how all that space investment is really translated into decades worth of investment in the U.S., um, in uh, ad advances in the U.S. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary. Uh, we focus on energy. Um, from Kenya, but I'm based here in the U.S. Looking at what he mentioned on the international market, uh, you mentioned about Angola, Nigeria, and other African producing countries like Tanzania and Kenya now. What do you think of the competitiveness and the pricing, and now that they are having their pipelines direct to China uh, to export their crude oil, can you, how are they going to collaborate into the United does United States think they are going to work with them one day, looking at their uh, protection, or uh, how is it going to be, or uh, comparing to their threat, to their direct uh, export to China and other international companies? Thank you. Countries. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, our demand growth outlook for refined products is around a million barrels a day every year, right? And so. You know, the world needs energy, and, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of diversification of, um, of uh, energy, uh, of uh, energy technology and um, different, different types of, uh, of, uh, of uh, cars and, and mobility. But at the end of the day, you know, gasoline and diesel is, is going to become a, is, will remain a big part of the transportation fuel. Um, we see really with the arrival of, of um, more production out of the U.S. that the West African production, much of the African production that was split kind of east to west, um, you know, we used to bring a bunch of West African crude into the U.S. That's really more shifted all over into Asia, right, which is, you know, a logical market because um, there's, that's where a lot of the demand is in the, in the emerging markets is the, you know, east of, uh, east of Suez, if you will. So um, there'll still be, you know, a big demand for, um, for crude oil, and we see, you know, a need for a lot of different uh, suppliers, you know, including many of the countries you, you, know, you mentioned. So they're all being impacted, of course, um, 
the speed at which some of that production is affected is much slower than in the U.S. because you've got you know these offshore pro projects that have got very long lead times and uh, are much um, move much slower in response than than kind of laying down land rigs in the U.S. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, there's the, the, there's a continued role there for for the, many of the producers that uh, that we've traditionally seen. Uh, I last uh, summer I went on the uh, conference that Secretary Moniz organized in Addis Ababa on African energy, and you certainly saw that the prospects, uh, uh, you know. East Africa had been ignored, or people just thought it wasn't perspective, and of course now it's seen as very perspective. However, I think in this new environment, uh, it, we're talking here about North America, what happens to uh, tight oil, but at the same time, you see a uh, postponement of a lot of projects, a slowing down of projects, a reconsideration of projects, and I think there's going to kind of be the view that it's a it's going to be much more competitive among countries in terms of attracting investment. It's not so much a seller's market as it was before, just because companies will be much more selective. So I think the timing of uh, new projects and development in many parts of the world, not to speak about Kenya, but in many parts of the world will not happen necessarily at the pace that might have been anticipated uh, a year or two ago. Okay, so our time is drawn to a close here. I just want you to join me in thanking uh, Rick and Kurt and Dan. A phenomenal discussion. We could have gone on. I was just telling Dan, you know, we could talk about Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Venezuela in a post-Maduro environment, figure out what's happening in Libya, how sanctions... And are you, are you going to tell us when the post-Maduro environment will start? So, uh, yeah, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Okay. But we would uh, urge you to join us on April 2nd. And then please join me in thanking our speakers. This has been a terrific discussion.